This episode of Nuff Said is brought to you by Tweaked Audio. To get awesome headphones, go to tweakedaudio.com and use the coupon code SOUTHGATE to get 30% off, free shipping, and a lifetime warranty. Or you can get there through the link on our website, southgatemediagroup.com. Recording has started. Hello, cats, cats, and kittens. This is the way. The way of super connectivity. I'm your host, Charlie the Professor Esser. Mustache game on point. And with me, as always, is the blue eyed bomber of the Burger Pits. Phil, fill me in. Phil, fill me in parrot. And may, may I say, I think that uh, mustache has gained sentience. It's a living thing now. It is, it is, it is a cruel mistress, the mustache, as Taft taught me in the old 90s uh, dick cartoon. Oh my gosh. Uh, Yes, the Mandalorian is back, Philip. Yes. I do not want to discuss spoilers right now, but oh my gosh, what a spoiler at the end! Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I'm not going to say it, but... Ah! I've actually looked on IMDb to ah! see if that's the same same actor or, or what it is, but we all knew who it was. Oh yeah, I mean they were kind of pointing that direction the whole the whole episode. I didn't tell you anything yet. Well, you don't know what it is because you don't know what I saw. Well, you're going to see at the end. You'll know then. And and it's I knew going in too. So, it, but I, I knew that there was something, but what the something was wasn't what we saw. But uh, yeah, oh my gosh. Well, a lot we don't expect is going to happen. And actually, the scene you're about to see right now, Tristan, because he's watching it right now. As we're talking about this, we're at the scene with the uh, pig guards uh, that were in Jabba's palace. They're fighting in the thing, which I'm sorry, does kind of have the feel of midget wrestling. Because they're clearly like, you know, they've got axes, but they're clearly like, you know, they're not trying to kill each other. It's like, it's like, clearly it's they're like. They're just trying to make a living. They lost their job when Jabba died. Well, you know, well, I mean, I'm sure Jabba didn't employ the entire race of green pig people, you know. Well, I mean, I don't, they, don't know what their exact race der- derivation are, but they are green. Well, I was going to say, they might and not they, be native to that planet. They might just be stranded on that planet and have to make a living somehow. Mm. Well, you know, that's the thing. It's, you know, they, they have a very imposing look, although... Honestly, I gotta say they look better in armor. Yeah, Who you put them in just the furry shorts; they kind of just look like guys with masks on their head. You know? <laughs> well, yeah, that probably is correct, Kristen. They probably are just guys with masks on their head. So, so I wonder. Like, did you notice this episode was like what was it like fifty four minutes long? Because season one, all those episodes were only like what like thirty some minutes. So I wonder if they're yeah, gonna, I wonder if they're gonna I don't be know long, if there's... longer episodes this season, maybe. I mean, I, I don't I think, think fifty-four minutes is is out of out of no. question. Why not? Most most of the streaming shows are like close to an hour, you know, somewhere in the neighborhood of yeah. an hour. Why not? Yeah, and and for what it's worth, they they're telling bigger stories. Mm-hmm. They've really got the technology. And one thing I will say is one thing you will see if you look at this up is that the technology in the Mandalorian has just changed the entire game for. No one got killed. Oh, oh well, he, that, he shot him, but I don't know if that killed him. <laughs> yeah, it might have been just to take him out of the scene, and that was to set up the, the other scene that just is now what you're watching. Yeah. And for what it's worth, man, Beskar armor. Why are you pointing a gun at a guy wearing Beskar armor? Eh, are they though? Are they? It's a TV trope. It's like it's like in the if, you know fifty Superman yeah. when the guy shot at him and the bulls didn't hurt him, so they threw yeah. their guns at him. <laughs> well, exactly. It's like you know, come on, we can see what we're dealing with here. Um, and oh my gosh, I mean, for a starting episode, this hits the notes. And this is one of these things that we were talking about over on Capes and Lunatics. Which is not really... I'm going to make the connection right here because it's all about super connection. 
Disney. You know, you know how I mentioned the 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 Black Lives Matters ad in DC Comics, and how when a multi billion dollar corporation says, "You know what? Maybe radical left politics is the future." You mean you mean voter? Or was it a vote? Wasn't it a voting thing? Not a Black Lives. Matter? Well, it was voting, but they literally have a kid uh, okay. wearing a BLM. T- I don't oh, think it was okay. Bureau of Land Management. Oh, okay. I don't think he's that big into Burning Man. Oh, um, yeah, Black Rock City. We will keep this place clean so the Bureau of Land Management doesn't get up on our, on our butts tomorrow. Um, you would have to have gone to Burning Man, and you see, that's that's always a thing. Is like you know, BLM yeah. to those who've been to Burning Man is you know Bureau of Land Management because they were they were the park rangers we had to deal with while we were defiling their you know pristine desert with our techno dances. Oh, careful when you dance on the sand, man. That is a dangerous game. Trust me, I know. You'll have to go back into older episodes to hear why dancing on the sand is dangerous. Ooh. You know. So, okay, now I'm talking too loud for Tristan to hear the guy. Yeah, so we just got to the scene where the Mando keeps his promise to not kill him Mando. by his hand. Oh, it's crazy. Um, yeah, but what I love about this is that it goes into this this lore, this lore building in the Star Wars universe that the Star Wars universe desperately needed. You know, that was the thing. Is like so much of the Star Wars universe was that white male protagonist's point of view. Well did, well, did you see that meme this week? It's like it was basically the Mandalorian is basically pulling the whole rest of the franchise behind. <laughs> oh yeah, and that that meme's been around for a while. Yeah. And yes, it is true. You know, I mean, look, John Favreau built the MCU. Oh yeah, he is the guy who said this is, and I, I don't mean that in, the, in a Jim Shooter or a Kevin Feige way. I, know. I actually mean that almost as kind of. A Steve Dicko or or um, or um, Jack Kirby way, you know. I mean, maybe even a Stanley way. I don't know if I want to go all that way yet, but I honestly feel John Favreau could be the Stanley of the MCU. Yeah, as that guy who was there at the start, who made some good stories, but also said, "Hey, just so you know, here's what makes a story work." And so I honestly feel John Favreau. Coming back into the Star Wars universe is the best thing that's ever happened to the Star Wars universe. Oh, yeah. And again, you know what? What is amazing about it is that what it is is that well, everyone else is going all J.J. Abrams and let's get bigger, let's get sparklier, let's put some lens flares in that. John Favreau says, Is there a way we could make this smaller? You know? Mm-hmm. You know, we can spray paint plastic to make Beskar armor. It doesn't. It's not that hard. Yeah, we already know how to make it look pretty. How about we we put a story behind it? Exactly. What are the human interactions here? Who are the freaking sand people? The Tuscan Raiders. Why are there Tuscan Raiders? No one knows. Exactly. Because it's like, well, they're raiders, and they like, yeah, because they live on a desert planet, and like oh. the only way to survive is this, and they've been here thousands of years. Charlie, so anyone saying that, well, you know, the Tuscan Raiders aren't native to, because I've gotten that in the comments yeah. too. Tuscan Raiders were actually na- came to this planet, came to Tatooine too. They're not native to Tatooine. It's like great, they've lived here a long time, and they have learned the ways of the land. Uh, look, we have a comment from a young lady, Miss Little Hellfire. Yes. Favreau is a better director than actor, for sure. That's pretty low bar, though. I mean, oh, I hate no, hey, all love for all love for John Favreau, but to bring back the Stanley analogy, Excelsior. Stanley wanted to be an actor, but he was a writer. Excelsior. He was honestly, uh, to have. John Favreau once one day say Excelsior. That'll be great. I hope someday we are crying over John Favreau in the way that we cried over Stanley. And that is the glory of the Mandalorian and what 
Disney Plus is trying to build oh, yeah. here. I, I think I think it's two of the you know two of the biggest things you know in his eulogy are going to be you know Iron Man you know starting the MCU and Mandalorian. Come on, yeah, re- re- saving the Star Wars, saving oh, Lucasfilm. Yeah. I mean, that's the thing. It's like Lucasfilm, and you know, and for what it's worth, Lucas has not been associated with Lucasfilms. I know this is that's the setup for what's going to happen later. <laughs> Lucasfilm. Tristan just saw it, kids. <laughs> George Lucas is not Stan Lee. George, Lu- first off, George Lucas is not a a salesman, a pitcher. <laughs> you know, crazy. he's not there out there building the cult of Star Wars. In many ways, he almost is kind of like, uh, yeah, I know I did that movie, like you know. 40 years ago, but have you seen Willow? Um, no! Ron Howard directed that, which is coming back. Willow is greenlit. Yep. The Willow sequel, which, uh, my man, um, damn it, what's his name? Oh, uh, Warwick. Warwick Davis. Yes. Yes. The original Peter, uh, Peter Dinklage, Warwick David. Oh, Davis. I'm sorry. Hey, look. You know what? Oh, know. Without Billy Barty, without Hervey Velasquez, even though they hated each other, without Warwick Davids, there is no Peter Dinklage. Mm-hmm. And I'm sure Peter Dinklage is going to be the first guy to say, "Yeah, no, absolutely. Those guys were great. Those guys really knew their place in the world, but also refused to say, I'm just this." You know, I'm going to take a short actor job because I'm short, but you know what? I'm not going to be defined by being a short actor. I'm going to be a great actor. And then you're going to start having people saying, well, man, I got to write a short guy for this role because I need a good actor like Billy Barty, like Warwick Davis, like Peter Dinklage, you know? And that's the thing. It's like, I think that you get more often than not people saying, man, you know, I mean, the Trask example is perfect for that. It's like, you know, I bet you someone sitting there saying, man, you know, you know what would be great for Trask is Peter Dinklage. You know, what if we got that great actor and yeah, he's short and then we could play on that in the story. Like, yeah, you know, he's short and maybe that's why he has a problem with people calling themselves homo superior because dang Skippy, if you're a short person and someone's calling themselves homo superior, you're probably really freaking afraid of those people. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, let's let's call a shelter half an entrenching oh, yeah. tool. So, you know, that's a whole casting choice that's made there. But, um, yeah, it's, it's, you're right, Tristan. I'm going to give you that spoiler. That's not Boba Fett. Um, <laughs> but you can tell that from the ill fitting armor from the first scene. But, uh, that's, and which I think is actually a neat little, like, call back to the fact that the actual actual original actor who played Boba Fett wasn't that big of a guy. <laughs> no, <laughs> so it's like you, nobody cared who was in the armor. They were just like, oh, look at that cool armor. <laughs> exactly, but when you put that cool big armor on like a little on an actual big guy. I mean, when you think of it, he wasn't even he wasn't even in the movies that much. I mean, you know, Empire Strikes Back, he was like towards the end of it, and then he was just like in the beginning of uh, Return yeah. of the Jedi. It's all about holiday special, man. That holiday, sp- which they're going to be doing a new holiday special, a Lego holiday special. Yeah. It's coming, man. It's why, like, you know, they, what just. They, why do they hide that original one? Do, I mean, they have the rights to Okay. They're, they're doing that out of deference to George Lucas because he made us think about it. Mm. That's the thing about Dis- Disney, don't so care. What? He don't Disney- own it no more. They paid him a boatload of money for all that stuff. They could do what they want with it. Well, I mean, true, but you also want to maintain, you know, it's sort of like any time that, you know, when the art, when the writer, like, says, oh, I was the part of the development of this thing, then everyone hates it. Mm -hmm. You always got to maintain that positivity. That's why everyone made, you know, not for nothing, that's why people made Marvel stuff. Because they knew Stan Lee would be right there to say, it's great. <laughs> no matter what it was. They're like, you know what? That's the great thing about Stan Lee. No matter what we do, Stan Lee's going to show up and say, yep. Because Stan Lee was playing the long game. He said, I just need to get the stuff in the mind 
into the zeitgeist. Yes, but I'm sorry. Once it's there, it's going to do its own work. I mean, they paid him billions of dollars. I mean, come on. Well, I don't. I, I don't think they ever paid him billions of dollars. For, he li- he was comfortable. Trust me. If he had a billion dollars, he wouldn't have been doing quite as many personal appearances. As he did, um, no, he had millions of. He he made. I will bet you he probably made as much as he spent every year of his life, and probably made sure that Jan was taken care of. No, I mean Disney paid. Didn't Disney pay him like billions? Stan Lee? No, 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 no. no. George Lucas. Oh, George Lucas. Yeah, but. Yeah. No, no, I know, well, I know Stan Lee and Nicholas. Okay, yeah, yeah, no, yeah, yeah. George, Lu- but George Lucas already, for what it's worth, had a couple billion from just Industrial Light and Magic. Because, oh yeah, you know, George Lucas is basically Jack Kirby of film. Yes, yes, because here Disney bought Lucasfilm for four billion dollars. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, but you know that it's not like it's a check for to to George Lucas. It's it's a corporate transfer. Yes. Oh, sorry, Lilith. Four point oh five billion. Fair enough, Lilith. But um, oh, look, that's, you know. that's why Boba Fett worked aloof and mysterious, not overused. Exactly. Aloof you and know? mysterious, um, like Hellfire. You know what I'll say is, you know, but that's the thing. The Mandalorians are cool, and they're cool because they readapt what people like about these films. Mm-hmm. They make you happy to see just the idea of settlers in a weird land or natives dealing with freaking colonizers coming to their coming to their land and having to deal with that, and that we have a way of doing things and you want to do things in your weird colonial way, and it's like that doesn't work in this 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 environment. We want you to understand that and Ah, uh, that's the complexity of it. Baby Yoda's in a spittoon. Uh, they never reference it again, but it's clearly a spittoon, and he's standing in tobacco spit. I'm just saying that right now. Yeah. Well, uh, well, well, well maybe that's why the rest of the episode, did he, like, basically stayed in a backpack the rest of the episode? <laughs> yeah. You'll see that in a minute, Tristan. Yes, it is explained. It's all explained. Because, again, it, it comes to the idea of late-stage capitalism destroying everybody trying to just have a life. Because, you know, and that's the thing. It is it's it is a perfect late-stage capitalist critique of, critique of late-stage capitalism, which is what billionaire artists do. You know, it's like, you know, the, McCarty, the Marquis de Sade is writing these horrifyingly... Uh, scary treatises because he's in a palace and he can just say, oh, let me write about the joys of whips. And I don't mean chocolate whips and vanilla whips. I'm talking other kinds of whips. Yes, they are. Chocolate whips and vanilla whips are fantastic. Strawberry whips, if you can get it. Uh, but, you know... Uh, but anyway, you know, that's the idea is that, so Disney is basically, Disney is the Marquis de Sade. They are writing transition, they're writing artwork for the masses that is at its core, um, destructive to the capitalistic hegemony, hegemony. I don't know where the E goes in that, but there is an E in there. I don't know if it's pronounced or not, but anyway. And that's Disney in this. Uh, And that's The Mandalorian, and it is awesome, and I'm very pleased with it. Okay, do you want to go on to more things, Philip? Sure. Let's talk the epic battle. Two megalithic corporations understood as the mouse and the rabbit. Disney and the brothers of the Warner. And their unending battle for dominance. We have always been at war with Eurasia. This, this, Asia has always been our ally. And Asia will be our enemy when Eurasia is our ally. This is the 
two halves of it, so we need a third guy to get here so we can start like trading off. But anyway, um, unfortunately, right now we're just at the two, and so we're they're kind of locked in a cold war. And the latest introduction to that cold war is the Spielberg averse, Spielberg cartoon averse of Tiny Toons versus Animaniacs. So, for those unaware, Hulu is doing the Animaniacs reboot, and HBO Max is doing a Tiny Toons reboot. And the irony of this is, is that the main characters in Animaniacs are the Warner Brothers and their sister. Uh And so, essentially, and what it really appears to be is that Disney came in under the radar and got Spielberg to say, hey, let's do uh, Animaniacs reboot for no reason. We just want to have this property right here. We want to help it grow. This was such a great show. We want to build it. And then all of a sudden, Warner's is like, wait a minute. Why is Disney taking the Animaniacs, our property, the Warner Brothers, and their sister Dot, and putting them on their Hulu streaming... Well, what did the list say? Nothing. It's the same. It's the same one. Okay. Um, no, it's just 4.5. Okay. Yeah. She, she, that, that probably means she's thinking. You know how you, in some places you get the little dots? Or she passed out. Yeah. No worry. Or she's just re- reblog, reblog, reblog. Anyway, but um, Warner's is sitting there f- caught flat footed by Disney again. Like, oh, wait, do we have 90s nostalgic cartoons that were utterly awesome? And they say, oh, well, we had in a, we had the Tiny Toons. Say, get me the Tiny Toons! So the Tiny Toons are being rebooted in HBO Max, which I'm, I'm looking forward to enjoying. Because, as many people are, I was a Tiny Toons fan for years before Animania, Animaniacs even showed up. Um, but I will say this, at a certain point when Animaniacs showed up, I did say, yeah, I don't even watch the Tiny Toons anymore. <laughs> you know, it wasn't worth my time. Now I watched the Animaniacs. They were the cooler show. And I feel bad for Warners on this, that they got caught, and that Disney stole Animaniacs out from under them. But I hope Warners... Okay, I know you're going to say, ha, 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 right now, Lilith. But I hope Warners are going to say, you know what? Let's reinvest in Tiny Toons. Let's see what made Tiny Toons click. Let's make that big. Let's leverage all the things that Disney can't use, like the backlog of Warner's characters. Um, like Bugs Bunny, like Tasmanian Devil, like, etc. <laughs> These are all the Steel Burger Birds. <laughs> You know, so really, right now, they should be locking down that Tasmania juice, that that uh, Tasmania franchise, and just start talking about uh, sweet, delicious orange juice. Mm-hmm. That's a Tasmania reference for those who don't know, because Taz's father talks like Bing Crosby, and Bing Crosby used to be the spokesperson for orange juice, which is a hilarious callback from before I was born. And that's how you know it's a great nerd callback when it predates your birth, and yet you still get it. They do that with the uh, the deacon on The Simpsons, when the deacon of the uh, Presbyterian Presper, Presper Church comes into town, and he also talks like Bing Crosby. Because Bing Crosby just had that great voice for that kind of thing. Um, so, yeah, it's interesting to see that that battle now played out between uh, Disney and Warners as these two megacorps and trying to figure out, you know, how they're going to move forward when, honestly, Warners is always, like, second to the, second to the party mm-hmm. and is yet to figure out how to make their own thing. Yeah, well, when they try to rush it and get there first, that's when they make their mistakes. Well, the, here they rushed it and they're getting their second. And I think, you know, 
I love Animania. I love the Tiny Toons. I'm not going to say I don't. I'm really looking forward to a Tiny Toons reboot. I love Babs and Buster Bunny. You know, and for what it's worth, you know, I am certain, for what it's worth, we're going to get a lot of Honey in the Tiny Toons. Because Honey was the character that Dot Warner is kind of based off of in... The Warner Brothers because in the Animaniacs because essentially there was this great episode of the Tiny Toons which was it, I mean it's sort of a left-handed backdoor pilot because it's not about the Animaniacs but it's about rediscovering this 1930s character and this character who's in black and white who now has to who gets who becomes reimagined and reawakened by uh, audience love, which likewise, you know, not for nothing, stolen from John Burns She-Hulk and, um, oh, uh, the Blonde Arr. Phantom. You know, uh, the Blonde Phantom, who's like, yeah, if I'm not paid attention to, I'll age. But if oh, I'm yeah. back in, back in, uh, if I'm back in attention, I'll, I'll, I'll get youthified. And that was something they stole for, for that, but it's great. So I'm imagining when we get to the Tiny Toons, we're going to be seeing a lot of Honey Warner in that. And maybe, you know, there will be that truce. I'm waiting for the truce between Disney and uh, Warner Brothers. Because we'll they have made truces in the past. And I imagine there will be, that we will get our Amalgam universe eventually. Where they're going to just say, you know what, what do, what do we say we go 50-50 on the profits? Let's hire a bunch of indie creators, tell them to write some Amalgam verse stuff, and let's make some money on that. Because as we said, indie comics, they're cheap and easy to produce, and you don't have to make a lot to make money. Um, so I don't know, they just always seem like, I don't know if there's people over on each side that are just like, no, we can't, we can't give in, we, you know. Yeah, well, that's what it is, and that's what we said last episode, which is that you know business should never be petty. And again, and two, you do like a crossover, like you know, like the amalgam stuff. You know, remember when they did the Marvel versus DC? It's like, well, each side's going to be like, oh, our guys will got to win, or you know. Yeah, but they they solved that they solved that well. They did some phone votes, and then really, even in the whole thing, no one ever actually won. Yeah, or true. lost. And you see that when you get the Captain America versus Batman. Which is that, oh, we're so evenly matched. They're like fighting for hours, yeah. <laughs> you know, it's like, oh, but this and then that and the other. And like, you know, you get that one moment when Bullseye catches the battering. That's like the one moment where things are like, oh, okay, so this is not not so easy. And But after that, you know, it's like, yeah, they fight. And like, it's usually a quick, you know, classic trickster god kind of thing where it's like, Oh, well, I'm going to use this, and that's what's going to give me the power. You know, and then, like, you know, when Wonder Woman throws away the hammer before she fights Thor, or before she fights Storm, you know, that's like, that's like her saying, I'm going to be a noble warrior, I'm going to do this the right way. Mm -hmm. And it gives everyone the say, yeah, but if she had held on to the hammer, she would have totally beat Storm, mm -hmm. you know. And that, but that's the thing, is they made, they wrote it in a way that everyone got to save face. Mm hmm. No one had to walk away. And that's the thing. And that's what we need to get back to. That's when capitalism works. Yes. When everyone's looking to save face, not everyone's looking to dominate someone else. Capitalism should never be about dominance. It should be about the stream of commerce. Give the customer what they want. Give the customer what they want, and the customer will give you what you want. Money. And we will all work together, and we will have a positive capitalistic vision it can work in argument in theory on paper but anyway that's for comic books and that's fantasy but all it needs is for business people to stop being petty want to talk a couple of quick comic books Philip? sure um okay quick tristan what do you want to tell me look at me so it gets on the mic Yes, the Tuscan Raiders com communication system, it's its noises, but it is also motions. So you must use both the motions and the sounds to give the communication. Yeah, that, that was interesting, like sign language plus the noises they're making, yeah. Well, I mean, honestly, for what it's worth, that's not unheard of and it's not uncommon. Know. 
And it is a real quality of many languages. And a lot of times what will make people think that other people don't have a language is they will not understand Mm -hmm. what they're doing because, you know, you know, when you think about the idea of gestures in language, and if you have a gesture based language that has sounds for emphasis, and then other people have a sound language with gestures uh, for emphasis, or yeah, if you have a gesture language with sounds for emphasis, and then other people have a sound language with gestures for emphasis, it's going to cause a lot of miscommunication. Mm -hmm. So, that is problematic. Um... We already talked about um, Spider-Man. You want to talk Hulk? Yeah, Mortal Hulk. Man. Um, 39. I mean, I loved it. I liked it. I, I, You know, I like... I'm not sure what happens at the end. I mean, that's the that's thing here with all of this it's and the almost, whole... I mean, I, the way I took it, it got me excited because I guess the leader pulls Bruce Banner out of his own body, I guess? Like... That never ends well. Well, th- well, hey, does that mean Joe's going to be running the ship over there? I mean, it means something. I- I'm yeah. a little weird by the hentai qualities of this. I don't know if anyone <laughs> has recently watched Lovecraft Country and their take on the uh, Kitsune. Wi- I don't know, man. It was a little too tentacly for my taste. And yeah. It's a little tentacly, too. And uh, I, I do... Yeah, well, you know, I mean, I like we get this image of Puck uh, sort of standing over the Hulk in in as he's restrained by quantum tentacles. Uh, right there, you got your quantum tentacles holding the Hulk, and Puck uh, with his arms folded, saying, "Yeah, you're not so big now, eh?" Yeah. Um, to see, Puck is all out of Canadian nice. That's all I'm saying. Um, you know. I like it. I find it interesting. Oh, this is interesting. Have you noticed that, like, Joe is purple in this? Um, I, in certain yeah. light, in certain light, yeah, and he is wearing a purple shirt. I mean, he's wearing that, like, Hawaiian shirt. It's a purple shirt with yeah. little flowers, yeah. Yeah, and I guess there is this idea that, because you see in this panel that, you know, banners are a little purple, too. Mm-hmm. But all I'm going to say is purple is an interesting color, to get spread around. You see this on the next panel, too. Um, you know, obviously, obviously, I'm going to go out on a limb here and say, this ends poorly for the leader. Uh, <laughs> you know, uh, and I think that, I think this is all building towards this weird little reboot where we're going to get Childlike Hulk and a Joe Fix-It merged banner where banner where the banner is going to be kind of joe fixity yes but he's going to be banner because that's like kind of as close to his base form as he ever really gets and it's going to be little joe but he's still gonna he's gonna have all the banner smarts oh yeah but he's gonna have this attitude like oh man what is this and then childlike banner is going to be the other half it's like all the all of the childlike qualities, but it's going to be it's going to be the big guy, and it's going to be interesting so, to so see Joe, how they all. Yeah, Joe's going to have to bust yeah. out of uh, Alpha Flight headquarters. He's going to be on the run, and it's going to be Joe to, trying to decide. You know, is this is this the time I Hulk out or no? Is this that going to make the situation worse? And Joe's going to finally understand Banner's side of this. You know, he'll be like, yeah, oh, well, exactly. I mean, yes, you know, why am I always small in this? Because. Because Banner, in his being a smart guy, Banner, which, you know, it's it's that joke. It's like, you know, as much as, you know, as much as the leader has better computating properties, his understanding of things is more limited. And that's your basic AI conundrum. It's like, I can have a thing that can do math really fast. Well, they're mo- I mean, Banner's mind's always thrown up roadblocks. Remember at the end of the Pantheon storyline, you know, Professor Hulk was all worried about losing control. So, like, whenever he got too mad, his body, you know, Savage Hulk was stuck in Banner's body. <laughs> yeah. Well, exactly. I mean, you know, but that's the idea is, is the idea that Banner is always in control. And when you're trying to do these things on the astral plane with the brain 
thoughts and things. It's like at a certain point, it's like there's a there is an anchor. This only has power within its anchor. Mm-hmm. And if you cut the if you cut the thread of the anchor, then it is loose and you don't control anything. Um, it's the old you know the idea of a kite. You know, a kite only can fly because you're holding the string. If you let go of the string, the kite falls down immediately because it's the it's the tension between the two things, between the grounded anchor and what you're doing that allows it to exist. And if you cut the thread, which, I mean, it seems like the leader is trying to do, then you just have essentially a, 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 a ghost of banner in your house and you don't have the tie to what the what the being really is at its core. So um, I'm fascinated to see where it's going. It's interesting, you know, when the leader essentially eats Brian Banner for whatever yeah. the heck that means. Absorbs him. Why? Well, I, I just thought he, he absorbed his mind or his soul, whatever. But is that going to be the leader's downfall? Well, that's the thing. It's like I'm absorbing the thing. But what is the thing? It's like it's like what did you just do? Did he absorb Brian Banner's soul? Because I mean, it was you know. Well, but what is a soul? That's sort of where it gets into this. It gets into the circular firing squad of well, what really actually just happened here? Yeah. What did what did we see and what did we discuss and what what is happening? And but is that going to be the leader's downfall? Is he going to be too emotional about Banner and the Hulk now? Well, I think he always has been. I think but it's I mean, always more so best. now. Yeah, well, yeah. I mean, it's always worse, you know. Yeah. I mean, I think what we're seeing is that, like, oh yeah, this is going to end poorly for. This is what I'm going to say. Say, I think this is going to end poorly for the leader. It's like, wow, that's no. that's a stretch. Um, the book is not called the Immortal Leader. No. It's called the Immortal Hulk. Yes. Um, did you get the chance to read Doctor Doom? No, I did not. Save yourself some trouble. Oh, no. Uh, oh, no. Is it taking a t- downturn? No, nah, I mean, I won't say it's taking a downturn. It's just, it has some good moments, but it is, it's all written as kind of diary entries. Wow. Uh, and so it's all like, it's just like exposition dump, exposition dump, exposition dump. Uh, and it's, I mean, it's not horrible, except for the fact that, you know, you're reading Doom's diary. And so it's how, like, how, how, do, how can you get a proper villain dialogue when it's all in his head? You know, well, except yeah, it's like, oh yeah, and Doom's a total narcissist, fascist, psychopath. And we'll get to the uh, the big twist at the end later. But what is actually kind of cool is the Blue Marvel in the black hole. Oh, um, we get a couple of shots of this. We get this whole thing with him dealing with Otto from the utopic universe. And lo- this is the thing I love. And oh, Lilith, you probably would have loved Doctor Doom. I will say that right now, because it is this idea of the black of the blue Marvel basically saying, and "I know I almost called him the Black Marvel." Uh, the blue Marvel saying, um, "Oh, I was in the evil universe all along, wasn't I? I was in the dystopia universe. It was me." I was the one who was. I was the one in the dark mirror universe, uh, <laughs> and but then again, that's that. And then you know, you get this nice breakdown with uh, Victorious, where she basically has to kill someone very close to her, and that makes her question everything. Then we got Blue Marrow fighting the Brood for no particular particular reason, like literally. He says, how did the brood get in here? What the heck just happened? So, but he goes over to the good universe. Laveria uh, conquers Chimeria. And uh, that happens. And then, uh, and then Doom realizes, I have to be a good person. I can't wait to tell the world I am here to save them from themselves. <laughs> Because that is the mark of sanity, if I ever heard it. Mm -hmm. Don't worry, people. I'm the Messiah. (laughs) That ends poorly. 
Anyway, um, did you get the chance to read Shang Chi? No, I didn't read that either. Didn't that's okay. Uh, long story short, the reason Shang Chi does not know his sister is alive, or that we've ever heard that he has a sister, is when they were little kids, little tiny baby kids, they wanted cake. Whoa. And Shang-Chi, being the older brother, would go, I right, bet they have cake in the forbidden room that we're never allowed to go in and our fathers forbid us to ever go into. So let's break into the forbidden room and get cake. Oh no, it's not cakes, it's full of skeletons! And that can't be good. And his father comes and he's like, oh, you've betrayed me, yada yada yada, because I'm not Fu Manchu, a copyrightable character, but some other character whose name is not Fu Manchu. And then he promises Shang-Chi since he says it wasn't her fault, it was me, show her mercy. And Shang and uh, not Fu Manchu says, I showed her mercy. And of course, Shang-Chi always met, thought that that meant, oh, you killed her quickly. Hmm. Um... So she actually grew up with uh, the hammer because we found out that there's the five weapons and this is yada, 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 yada. There's a whole rigmarole of the different weapons and powers. And apparently the, 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 the guild of the hammer are in Siberia and Shang-Chi is just not impressed. Um, <laughs> but for what it's worth, his sister does in fact kill him at one point. Because she poisons him so that she can be the head of the Five Weapons Guild. Uh, but then, you know, the character who is now a skeleton, and in no way the trademarkable, copyrightable character of Fu Manchu, so don't ask, uh, brings him back to life. Um, and then there's a weird thing with him seeing, like, the stars falling out of his skin, yada, yada, yada. He is saved by characters we saw last issue that were weirdly not in this issue, even though we saw them last issue. So there's a lot that's going on that's a little weird here, Hmm. but I'm still enjoying it. I'm in for Shang-Chi. So there we go. That's Shang-Chi too. It's weird and crazy and enjoyable, but you know what? I would say pick a copy up and enjoy it. You have too many questions, then write them and see if they'll give you answers. Did you read Savage Avengers? Of course, I read Savage Avengers. Philip, what did you think? Because I've talked so much so lately. Boy, you got the o- you got the opposite of what you wanted in this issue. You wanted Conan to put pants on. He he was naked. <laughs> well, he was enjoying himself. And he was enjoying five women. You know what? Um, you know, sometimes you have to, you know, downplay it and, you know, just, no. just have the five. Um, and Blackwood was like, and he went back to it. Did anyone, are we just going to gloss over that he went back and like killed the Shimon Gorath and then went back and one, two, three. I only count. Oh, no. Yeah, yeah, there was the fifth because that's the one that becomes. Yeah, who gets possessed. That's the one that takes the thing. Who gets possessed by the cursed cocaine. <laughs> Don't do coke, man. It'll turn you into a Shimagorath. And then a barbarian will kill you. And then a barbarian will kill you with one of the other lady's legs. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, and he's like, he's like, man, I'm sorry. I just grabbed the first thing and it was your leg. And, you know, it died valiantly. It's oh. like, but she's like, yeah, that's, that's cool, man. Come back to bed. <laughs> yeah, luckily it was a fake leg, not a real one. Oh, I'm guessing she has a spare. Yeah. <laughs> But, you know, here is, I'm going to say, the buried lead of the whole thing when, you know, here's this thing. So, Philip, I don't know if you watch Lovecraft Country. No, I have not watched it. Here's the thing about Lovecraft. And for those who don't know, Haggard and Lovecraft were like best buds. And Lovecraft... Of which Shimagorath is very much a Lovecraftian kind of elder one. Um, you know, Lovecraft is the original Grimdark. Which is that no matter what you do, no matter what you try, the monsters are going to get you. Because mm-hmm. there are monsters, and the monsters are going to get you. And we kind of get that at the end of this episode. When 
Doctor Strange asks Conan for spoilers, spoilers, spoilers. Uh, when you kill, uh, kill, what's his name? Uh, Kulin Gar, Kulin, Kulin yeah. Garth, Garth, Party on Garth. When you when you kill Party on Garth, um, uh. it just save me a piece. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Says all my all he needs a finger or just some blood, some you know. Yeah, just a, it's flesh, some, just a no. bit of flesh caught in your blade. Yes. As as Party on Garth is uh, eating a little bit of, of of tentacle, and you know it's like clearly oh, Conan is the voice of reason in the room. <laughs> this is what we get to in this. It's like Krom, the our Nihilist god, is the one true being, and um. <laughs> it is it is a weird way that it's playing out. And I'm here for it. Yeah. I'm not going to lie to you. But, I'm here for it. But do, do you think it was weird? I mean, I get he sells books, but when Black Widow's like, oh, you know, you know, oh, tainted drugs, you know who we need? Frank Castle. I'm like, okay, yes, Punisher goes against drug dealers, but I mean, against this mystical stuff. I mean, we're going to pull Frank Castle. Well, Castle except that the mystical stuff that dies by bullets. Eh, I guess. I mean, remember when when the fairies were like, ah, he has iron bullets. True. Why does this person have so much iron? Why aren't they hitting us with laser beams? We're good with those. Why are they shooting us with these bullets? They didn't put Wolverine and Frank Castle on the front line. <laughs> Just go to town, boys. <laughs> what happened, Tristan? You okay? Oh, you... He pulled his neck muscle trying to throw himself back on the autumn on the chair and he did too many things with his body at once. Ah, sports injury, okay. Yeah, it's 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 a nerd injury. <laughs> it's a nerd injury. He's a little embarrassed by this, but I hope you enjoyed it, Tristan. That was Mandalorian episode one. You well, you saw someone oh, or did he look like Captain Rex? It is the way. I do look like Captain Rex because, well, if he grew an awesome mustache. Mustache! <laughs> anyway, yes. No spoilers for anything. No. I don't know what we're talking hey, about. Hey, if you want the spoilers, you want the in-depth review of episode one of season two of Mandalorian, stay tuned in a few weeks. Full stream ahead is going to be doing that. Yes, full stream ahead, we'll be discussing the Mandalorian. I, I do have to get official approval from Maz, but when it came, when I suggested it, like, that was like the one time Maz ever interacted with the Games of Learning Dicks. He was like, yes! So, there's that. So, I, I think we're going to talk about this sure, after thought, the boys. I'm pretty sure he enjoyed season one. Oh, you very much did. I mean, honestly, it's a great season. It's like, as has been said, mm-hmm. the Mandalorian is pretty much awesome. It's like the best, it is literally the best thing that all of Disney is doing. And Disney does a lot of good things. It's like, it's not like Disney's like, oh, they do a lot of lousy stuff. But then it's, it's not like, you know, oh, hey, here's Spawn, kids. Um, and again, I know it's 2020, but it's just like watching Mandalorian. It's just, I'm, I'm, I want to see what they do with the Marvel stuff. I want to see what WandaVision looks like. I want to see what Falcon oh, Winter Soldier looks like. Why? Why are they delaying it? Well, I mean, they had this. I mean, Falcon Winter Soldier. I know, they had, I know. They got the late shooting, but yeah. Not for nothing. I kind of feel like Feige's almost getting in his own way. His, well, he's letting his plan over over dominate himself. Well, like we said, are they going to wait another month or so to, to release WandaVision? Because it's like, do you really want to blow your? You know, do you want to release Mandalorian well, and I WandaVision think what they're doing at the same is they're time? Trying to t- Honestly, what I am imagining they're doing is just saying, okay, what did what we do in Black Widow influence all of these things? How, what is the, what is the level of reveal we want here that were, that is, that was meant to not be a reveal? Essentially, it's like, you know, it, it's sort of like, I guess, you know, when you get to Discovery, which I haven't watched yet with, I don't know, season whatever, when they, she's in the far, Far flung future. Season three. Yeah. Yeah. That basically they're going to talk about things that happened after. Um, and here I'll say something I have after, watched. After everything. When you talk about things on, on, on lower decks, they're like, oh, yeah, no, that's just canon. We know this. This is what happens. And this is the universe. 
And so now they're going to say, okay, now this was meant to be a just a this is the universe statement. But now we have to make this that this is the first time we're hearing about it. Oh, my. So does this work as the first time we're hearing about it? Oh, my God. I saw a meme this week, a Star Trek meme. You'll love this because it's, it's a lower decks joke. But they, they took the scene that, uh, from Picard season one when Riker and Picard are talking and Riker's telling Picard, you know, I had the <laughs> privilege of working with the, you know, the greatest uh, Starfleet officer, you know, basically ever. And, you know, Picard's giving him that love look, and then he's like, I wonder if, uh, I wonder if O'Brien stayed with Keiko or not. <laughs> oh. I thought, you, I thought you, I thought you, I thought you were going to, uh, reference Mariner, but that's okay. No, 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 he mentioned O'Brien, you know, greatest Starfleet officer of all time, Chief O'Brien. Well, he is, he is. I mean, O'Brien. Up there with Scotty. He goes like Scotty, maybe O'Brien Scotty. I'm not going to say where the Scotty O'Brien LaForge triumvirate really goes in. Okay. I'm sorry, Balana, someone had to be fourth. Oh. Um, I don't mean to do that. I don't mean to do that. Uh, but, you know, it's like, you know what? Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, in his defense, I mean, they were stuck in the Alpha Quadrant, or the Delta exactly. Quadrant for and seven hey, years. you know what? And, and didn't get to know, talk F- to a lot of her peers, you know. F me, she does the slipstream drive. She gets it working. So, you know what? Maybe, maybe Balana's the one, and just because she just didn't get the recognition. Gee, a woman of color not getting rec- recognition for all of the stuff she did. Where's where where have I heard that before? So um Yeah, no one gives those Klingons any respect. Yeah. Well I mean well I mean the act. I know, but, I yeah. know. That's a joke. But yeah. I was gonna go into the thing about that's not what we do here. We always, always, always give mad respect for Little Hellfire, our official woman of color. So um She rules she rules in fear. She rules with she rules with quality, honestly. <laughs> Bing. Yeah, if she, she if she had two E's, they would be for quality. Oh, um, nice. Fortunately, she has two L's, I think. Well, I mean, there's two L's in yeah, L, hell, so. Yeah. Yeah. Look for the two L's for quality from now hey, on. Hey, she has kids. two H's in the middle. Two H- oh, there we go. Look for the two H's in the middle for quality. Bing. Bing. Uh, well, this is awesome. Okay. Anyway, uh, I think that's all my books, Phil. You have anything else you want to talk about? No, I think that's. The, I think we've basically discussed every Marvel. We book we have gone nuts on this show, and so let's call it an end. Uh, Philip, did you have any problems hearing me tonight? Um, I don't know. What did you say? Uh, you know, Philip, I have to say this. I have to say this all the time. Sometimes people have a hard time hearing what we're talking about because they have substandard headphones, Phil. That's right. They're going to the dollar store. They're buying the dollar, the literal dollar headphones. I know because I've done this myself because I didn't care that much. Bought it at the convenience store, you know, just to hang yeah. out. The well, no, I mean, literally, you can go to the oh, dollar yeah. store and, like, for one dollar, you can get the wired headphones. You know, it's a 50 50 shot if they work. People do this. People do this all the time. It's a, it's and and it's a dollar. But, you know, you spend a dollar, you spend a dollar, you spend a dollar. Eventually, by the end of the year, you've spent like $40 on headphones. Why not instead go to tweakedaudio.com? Get some freaking high quality headphones. Spend all that money at uh, once and get headphones that'll last and are quality. Exactly, quality headphones that aren't going to break the first time you use them. And you know what? Here's the thing: they're not even expensive as they look because you know what? You can use the coupon code Southgate to get a discount on them, and then you have good headphones and you can hear what the heck we just said. Um, and if you use that coupon code Southgate, there, you know what else? You can use that same coupon code for over at huntedkiller.com. Get a discount on the huntedkiller.com package to get an escape room essentially delivered to your house on a regular basis. It's awesome. And you know what? It's cool. You and your friends can sit there and solve a murder case for the admittedly fictional private detective. Michelle Gray. She needs your help. She wants to solve this case. You can help her. And if you want to go for the uh, genre piece, it is Halloween, although when this airs, who knows? 
But you can get the Blair Witch mystery as well. So that's over there at HuntKiller.com. Check it out. Please enjoy. And then, or if not, go down to our show notes. Click on Amazon.com. We have a link in our show notes. That, that's going to take you to Amazon. We can buy anything the heck you want. Costs you nothing. Helps out the show. And while you're there, you can check out Pod Life the Book, a book written by and for the Southgate Media Group uh, podcast family, and for you as well. Basically saying why people podcast, how they podcast, and how podcasting saved their lives. So you may want to check that out. And anyway, I think that's all of my things. Uh, Philip, if someone wants to reach out to you, how can they do so? Uh, if you want an easiest way to get a hold of me or any of the rest of the team, uh, email capesandlunatics at gmail.com or call the voicemail 614-382-2737. That's 614-38-CAPES. And you can find links to all of our stuff, uh, social media, uh, merchandise, Patreon, all of it. Uh, links to it, our YouTube channel. You can watch this video there and more. Uh, Linktree, L-I-N-K-T-R dot E-E slash capesandlunatics. Awesome. And of course, you can always write to me their old fashioned email way the way our mothers and fathers once did at superconnectivityblog at gmail.com. That's superconnectivityblog at gmail.com. And follow me on the Twitter as I live tweet uh, the DuckTales universe for some reason at 7 o'clock on Mondays. That's the thing I'm doing now. Why not enjoy it at Charlie Esser? That's C H A R L I E S S E R. Look for the two E's in the middle. For quality. Bing! Thank you, Maz. We should do that for Lilith. Um, oh, yes. Uh, and then she can say thank you, Maz. Anyway, friends and neighbors, children of all ages, this has been another Super Connectivity. Thank you for listening to us. I hope you come back again next week and super connect with us again. Good night. Good night. I do like our theme song. It's got a very Doctor Who y vibe. It was picked up by one Robert Southgate. Robert Southgate, he's you know, he's good he's the Stan Lee of podcasting. Excelsior. He should he should be our he should do he should do cameos on our things. Oh yeah, oh we'll have a picture or something. Every episode should have a Rob Southgate drop. It is so says Master Do. It is the way.